what my discipline was. These people seemed to know. They were in their dissertation period. They were doing their postdoctoral work. And the architects sat there and looked at each other. So tonight I would tell all the students in the audience, get into your library, go to the other libraries in the city, go to Ann Arbor, go anywhere you can to read. And then when you think you've read it all, read some more. Because you've got to educate yourself. Your teachers can only do so much for you. So it's really a, a, a wish of mine for all of you to educate yourself because it is your responsibility and never, never stop. You simply can't stop. And I haven't stopped. Uh, I don't know what good it's doing me, uh, frankly, but as there is no work for any of us, as you all know, uh, <laughs> and that's not what makes the world political. It's just something that none of us understand, but one or two sitting in the front row. Um, but here is, here's a, here is a library designed by McKim and White, and they themselves went to the Academy as soon as it was finished. They went on their own two-year excursion. It was three years in those days. And what a fine time they had, and I did as well. My studio, this is one little corner of my studio looking out to the city of Rome. As I said, we were very high. I didn't realize at the time that the light outside was so much brighter than inside that it would just turn the city white, but it did. But trust me, the, the view was extraordinary. And here are some of these outrageously big drawings I was doing at the time. I don't know what caused me to do that, except that I went to the art stores where they told me to go to buy great French uh, arches paper, and it was 30 by 40 inches. And I thought, well, I can't cut it. It's got a decal edge, so I've got to draw it this size. And I would put this, this is a drawing lesson, okay? I would put these great pieces of paper on the ground, no matter what the surface was, and I would do these ink wash drawings. This is, happens to be uh, of, of the fountain that is just below the academy called the Aqua Paolo, uh, the, the, the fountain of, of Paul. And because St. Peter and Paul were thought to be crucif crucified um, on, on this very perch that the academy is on. In fact, the Tempietto uh, di San Pietro is one of the three St. Peter's in Rome where they thought St. Peter's might have been crucified. They didn't want to get it wrong, so they consecrated all three sites. <laughs> well, we know the, the big St. Peter said that one won. Uh, but nevertheless, here's this other. And one of my painter friends, and here's where the, it pays off to have colleagues at the Academy, somebody who was a figurative painter, extraordinary in his skill, somebody I looked up to. Uh, and he, he said, Michael, he, he and I would go out and draw together sometimes. He let me draw for a year this way. And he would sit there with a sketch pad no bigger than this and draw and then turn the page and draw again. He was a fine artist, he wasn't an architect. He was drawing things that I wasn't interested in, and uh, I was drawing things that he wasn't interested in. And he was interested in making a composition, and I was interested in recording the architecture. I was never very interested in baby carriages and balloons and, and cappuccinos sitting on, on tables in, in the Piazza Colonna. So you'll have to pardon me, these are just sort of down and dirty, but he approached me one day and he said, I didn't do that. Um, he said, uh, Michael, maybe I can save you from yourself. I said, why, why Leonard, what, are you, what do you want to say? And he said, you're drawing on these hideously big pieces of paper. You take them back to your studios, you sell them for $50 a piece, and you take yourself off to Spain and England and so on doing this. I know why you're doing it. It's a very interesting commercial event that's going on here. But if you would get a small sketchbook 
you would be able to look at the monument you're drawing, draw with it in front of you, and maybe get the proportions right. <laughs> or you can look down on the pavement, lose the image, it's only in your mind now, draw, hope, look back up, hope you've got it right, but I can tell you, in most instances, you won't. I had a wonderful question from one of the people wanting her book signed today about proportion. We won't go into that, it's not part of tonight, but proportion is absolutely everything in architecture. Proportion of idea, proportion of decoration, proportion of color, everything has to be done with measure. All right, let's, let's leave this, we'll make it, never get finished. That was my studio uh, terrace. Uh, it had actually a, a glass window uh, to the painter that I was just describing down below. I could tap on that and, and know that he was working. But there you see the, in beyond, you see the city. You can even see the beginning of the Corso here, all along there, uh, with Vittorio Emanuele, the white uh, building on the right. Not the finest in Rome. Uh, but here's the Aqua Paolo, and I did it very early on because, after all, it was right below the academy. The only thing that separated this from, from uh, the American Academy was, was the Spanish Academy. Oh, actually, I believe the Spanish Academy is in our foreground. I take that back. And here are more of these big drawings, the way I was taught at Cincinnati, and didn't have, I guess, what one might call, if you were pompous, to say, I didn't have my own hand yet. And here they are. They weren't bad for a beginner, but I realized I could make a study just of domes, and more domes, and more domes. Last night at dinner, um, the name Pietro da Cortona came up. I really think Pietro da Cortona's dome of Santa Luca Martina in Rome is the best dome in Rome. And it's marvelous. It's a marvelous story because he's both a painter and an architect. And he's buried in the steps leading up to his, his uh, great church. <coughs> Pardon me. That's a good way to go. Now, it's not. Somebody get that. It's a new job. <laughs> um, and uh, just say yes. Yeah. When, when I returned uh, to the United States, I had written all the schools that I could commute to from New York to spend another five years in Manhattan before moving back to uh, the Midwest, to Indiana. And uh, the best offer came from Princeton, except the, the dean at that time said, uh, we don't want you to live in New York, we want you to live in Princeton, and you only have to teach three afternoons a week and two mornings, and they can be on the same afternoons. And so you could, you could be here for three days and have an office or work for somebody in New York, but you should live here and commute to New York. I thought that was a foul idea. Uh, I said, well, I'll try living here and uh, commuting the other way. So I, I did. I never went to New York. I loved Princeton so much when the day I got there, there was something about Princeton and living on the ground and, and um, some of my Hoosier roots were coming out and the idea of walking to school, walking to our high street, uh, Nassau Street, all of that from my, my, my subs heavily subsidized faculty house was very, very appealing. So I sat there and did competitions and worked very hard. And after living in a couple of other houses, was walking 
was married at the time and was walking with my daughter in another section of Princeton from my early houses and from where I was living now in a kind of a dump of a house. And, and uh, my daughter, who was young at the time, and I were Sunday morning walking, sorry, not to church, but just for a walk. And, and we looked down this driveway, well, the driveway, which is here. And I said, Annie, that looks like a ruin. It looks, she said, it looks like Rome, Daddy. So we walked back, and this poor dilapidated building wasn't a house, clearly wasn't a house. It looked like a kind of barn or warehouse. Roof was falling in, no plumbing, heating, or electricity. But we wandered around inside, and there was a sign for sale. So I said, you know, this looks like it was built by Tuscans. This looks like an, it's an, an Italian barn. And I did a little research. I hate that word. Uh, I did a little investigation and found that, in fact, an Italian who had moved to Princeton as a mason and was building Gothic dormitories preva prevailed on some of his, his friends who were also Italian also from Tuscany, to build a warehouse for him, which he would sit at one end, uh, drink scotch all day, and sort of watch the books, or the pianos, or the couches, or whatever anybody would store there. It was very successful. The second year, he built another wing, which was this wing. and. Um, he did that until he croaked, and, and it fell into disrepair. Nobody wanted this building. In the center of town, would never be allowed today. It wasn't residential. This was a residential middle-class neighborhood. So I thought, for $30,000, what a bargain. And um, I can't tell you how many 3000s it's taken since <laughs> then for a new roof, new plumbing, new heating, new electricity. And this yard here was 20 feet high with uh, garbage from the neighbors. In fact, the neighbors thought this building was so ugly, they built this wall, uh, which suited me just fine. Some, uh, uh, some folks out in the Hamptons who I built a house for, uh, I, I had designed a a kind of alley, which they planted out with these very trees. And then they decided to change the plan and said, Michael, would you like the trees? Oh yes, three bags full. So I took the trees and here they are. And Alfred knows this story very well. Um, but anyway, uh, this house is after, now from 1969 to the present day, the governor's wives came here. It's not a sexist remark. There were no husbands. Um, they came uh, when the governors had a conference in Princeton. And one of the, this was during the first term of, of Clinton, so you can date it. But it was more or less finished at that point. I, I don't know when that was, 80, 80 82. Uh, but the, the, uh, somebody was walking up, one of the women in very high heels, not the four inch heels we have today, but we're walking up the gravel driveway. The gravel driveway was meant to be like the Twitteries. Um, and yet it was very dense with gravel. And we, were, we all met in this former uh, pit here. I didn't tell them this, what they were standing on. But we were all standing there and there was a tent and drinks were being had by all and before we went into the warehouse for a tour. tour it's, is called the warehouse now, or the house of wares. Uh, and this one wife said to me, Deary, how long has this house been finished? I looked at my watch and I said, 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you came 20 minutes ago, and that's when I decided it was finished. So here it is from one vantage point, and I added a little loggia to the side here. And what you're going to get now 
is a heavy dose of the influence of what I found in Rome, how it has affected my thinking, my architecture, the very way I draw and communicate with people. But here's a little terrace that we use in the spring and fall. It's beastly hot in the summer. And it's, a, it's, it's Michigan weather, really. It's the same. And it's impossible in the wintertime. So there are only about three or four months where we can use this terrace. And here's the old boy here, re reading Matisse, actually. Uh, wonderful biography. Um, and then looking out at my new trees and uh, waiting for the summer picnic of all my employees who come here. And it's potluck now in these hard times for the last two years. <laughs> but, but we have a good time. You can do a lot with paint. You can do a lot with four seeds. And you're going to think that I photoshopped those two roses on there, but I, <laughs> I didn't. But I realize now that if I did about six or eight more roses, you'd never ask the question. So I think I will. Um, here's a painting I made of looking up my driveway at my house. I painted it because I was adding at the time, I've been paralyzed for seven years. And here, ooh, so I'm so sorry. I learned how to do this this afternoon. Um, and I'm very slow. But here is the elevator machine room. And here is a little piece of architecture. And here is the elevator. And beyond that is a stair, which was, when I moved in, a hand-operated elevator. It was a sheet of plywood there was, you would take pianos up to the second floor with a rope pulley. And I put the stair in that, never thinking that I would need it. Um, my elevator's a little fancier than, than that. But what I have done, as you can see now, is, oh, I'm so sorry, wrong button. I've added the fireplaces. This is bedroom up here and living room down here. So there's a bump on the side over here. There are bumps on the side there to announce the front door. I took the ceiling away in this room there so that the light would come in. Remember when I showed you the vestibule of the academy? And then realizing that the existing stair was a bump, I added the bump here and here. And that became, as the architects would tell you, those of you who are not, the party for the building. Coming into the foyer, um, is here, and remember the sarcophagus which you saw in the foyer of the American Academy. Here's mine, deaccession from the Minneapolis Museum, before I started working there, so I had to pay, pay full price. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought it was an interesting play on my last name, so it's been there and <laughs> rumbles all day long. Um, and that fountain comes originally from the, uh, the great fountain of Bernini. Um, today, it just happened that I talked to America's great Bernini scholar, Ir Irving Levin. I, he asked me what I was going to talk about, and I said, there will be one slide of, of the Tritone fountain. So here it is. And I show it to you with the Dolphin Hotel, which has fountains and each, at the end of each one of these sets of rooms, which I called piers, and Michael Eisner thought that was so romantic uh, that I would call them piers. But he said I couldn't use fountains here because the wind would blow so hard that anybody walking down below would get, would get wet. And I said, no, they've got fountains that, that decrease in velocity with the, with the increase in velocity of the wind. He said, no. And I said, yes, you remember the, you remember the, uh, the rustication on the academy. Well, we don't use here the rust real rustication, but there's our spogi, which are the forests, the great banana forests of, of uh, Orlando. And they're painted on by scene painters of, of Disney. A lot you can do with a brush. So I don't want to ever hear you say there wasn't enough money. And inside, we're going to just see these kinds of places 
which are interesting to me, maybe to you, but why I show them to you. For instance, a friend of mine, Massimo Scolari, has a collection of artist tools, of architect's tools, pardon me. He has a 19th century architect's bench with many drawers, and in it are wonderful tools that architects of the, of the last century and before used. And part of those tools were always magnifying glasses. So on a trip to London, I found a magnifying glass, I think it was this one, with this curious ivory handle, no longer uh, possible because it's endangered. And here's the glass. And then I started to see all of these. And each time I went to London, I would buy another magnifying glass. It was just something I had to bring home. Little did I know that years later, I would find myself working for Target stores where we were designing simple kitchen gadgets, nothing much to write home about, but a gadget which somebody who's 85 and perhaps with arthritis can open a jar with or peel a potato with or baste uh, the ham with right here and do all of that based on these very interesting handles that you see on the left. So it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the shape of our hand. Forget ergonomics. Just look at your hand and look what it can hold. And the next time you pick up a knife or a fork or a spoon designed by a designer, put it back down again and ask the waiter for another uh, knife. Because you know what they are. You don't know one end from the other. You could put the business end in your mouth and you wouldn't know. For Alessi, pardon me, for uh, uh, Vitali, we designed these, these handles. Again, always thinking of the grip. And as these are now the law in the United States for public buildings, uh, this, this preceded that. This is the living room of the warehouse. It had very low ceilings. And I had to get in the, and no basement. Strange for a warehouse. But I had to get the heating, ventilating, air conditioning into it. So I took it up to the top and made decoration out of the vents, as you see around here. They act as denti around the, 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 the ceiling. And where most people would say, oh, that's going to lower my ceiling, what I did, in fact, was use that to suggest the ceiling is actually higher. So here is the ceiling. That's actually a very, very light blue. Uh, not Tiepolo blue, but a wonderful light blue here. And then the furniture you can see is Biedemeyer, a period of time, 1820 to 1860, thereabouts. And you'll see some wonderful paintings on the wall. Uh, Corot uh, of the bridge at Narni, and Corot again of the city of Rome, uh, a Corot there of a sketch of Narni. Corot would go out and make very small oil sketches, come back to his studio and add a tree or two, add a couple of, of shepherds and some sheep, and clean up the bridge a bit and make a much bigger painting. So I thought that was lovely. Now, after I've teased you, these aren't Corot's. These are mine. I trained myself to paint like Corot so that I could. Because when Corot was on the Grand Tour, he painted, of course, the atmosphere. He painted the sky. He painted light. He painted clouds. He went to the, the, the Via Antica um, and, and painted clouds. He painted the aqueducts. He painted everything. And you'll see, I did it as well. But here is the living room looking from the other side, a sketch that David made. Oh, I should tell you, nothing in my house is real. Nothing is original, not, well, not quite. Nothing is really real. Uh, this is an etching in four panels from a sketch done by Dafour uh, that, from, in turn, a sketch by uh, David. Uh, but everything is grand tour and therefore seconds. 
uh, Biedermeier comes after uh, Louis Couture, and, and uh, the sculpture is that you see in a place like that is again Grand Tour. So maybe the rug is real. Oosh. This is another real thing I have. I think, it, I think it's real. I'm trying to get somebody to tell me that it is or isn't. But this is a Proudhon. And here is good up here. And here is evil there. Evil has just killed this fellow. Their typical 19th century pose. Uh, but he's now dead. And he's carrying off the loot here. And this, a larger version of this, is in the, the lobby of the Palace of Justice in Rome. People liked it so much, they had Proudhon painted smaller versions of it, the commercial Proudhon. And mine has a seam. You can just see it there, though some of you in the front row. There, and there's another one across here. So presumably, these were studies that Proudhon made and then he stitched all three groupings together and had his studio paint in between. And this makes my Proudhon. I bought it for the price of the plaster uh, period frame. So I can't really afford it. So I'm an architect, remember. And this is a fascinating second. This is a Claude Lorraine. Well, not actually, and neither is this. But, <laughs> but Claude uh, had painted a, this wonderful trip to Egypt, and in a divorce settlement, uh, the one that, that won the coin flip uh, got the real one, and I got the, it wasn't my wife that went away, it was somebody else's, but I bought it. Uh, it was just too good a story to be true, but it's probably not. Um, now, I want to show you the sense of humor these folks had. This is, this is a little, sarcophagus, again, uh, a little heavy on the last name, but these are all pieces that you find in the Vatican, every one of these. But this one is in the Pantheon, not in Rome, but in, in Paris. And this is Napoleon with Napoleon's hat here, and these are all ink wells. Now you can see from the size of these uh, vases here what size these are. They're little trinkets that you would take home to mom and dad if you were if you were a sculptor uh, on the Grand Tour. Now, let's look at Napoleon's tomb again. Now we see it full face, and here's a little pillow, so the hat won't have to sit on the tomb itself. Here are these wonderful feet. In fact, before modern science, before Newton, everything had feet. You couldn't put a piece of furniture on the ground without a foot. It started out with a lion's foot and then went to a fawn's foot. You know that. And here are the lion's feet. And not to show the strength, well, perhaps to show the strength of, of Napoleon. But let's go to the next. I take the top off and there's the inkwell and the place for the powder. And it's now take that off and there's just the cavity. And look into the cavity, and there's Nappy taking one. <laughs> ah, so sorry. This is very sensitive. I, I, I've known women like this. This is a, <laughs> not there, not there. Okay. Here is my library in my house. Uh, it was once a stairwell where you carried, carried heavy pieces of furniture up if you didn't take the elevator. I, um, I have a pretty good collection. As I told you, I read it a lot. I looked a lot. Like Robert Motherwell, I don't feel at all guilty on the weekends looking at my art books. Not just reading them, but looking at my art and art books. And I, I remember Peter Eisenman's, you, the architects in the audience know Peter and his architecture, but Peter is one of my best friends, surprisingly enough. Um, but he looked at my library and he said, I hate you. I hate you. 
I really loathe you. And I loathe Meyer too. Uh, both of you. I hate both of you. I've got a better collection than either of you. But I, I've got Ikea shelves. And, <laughs> and you've got bird's eye maple. How can you afford that? And I said, Peter, you've given me a line for a lecture I'll give someday. Um, these columns are PVC pipe, and these are pressed wood, and so nothing is real in my house. And here's the library of the American Academy in Rome, and they asked for this room, but they said, unlike your library, Michael, we can't have any uh, uh, materials like wood that aren't inert. So you'll have to make a steel room for our precious collection of Palladio and everything else. So what I did was to make a little steel box. I didn't want to make a steel room. I made a steel box, made it look like a window, gave it a door, and put it between wood. And that's quite legal in the, in the rare book of uh, sense. 